Okay. So um, we're going to, uh, I really wanted to give a slightly different talk than the, than the one that I typically give. Um, and more focused on public understanding and, and, uh, and, and give you an idea of sort of systems thinking at, at a big picture level and then share some organizational style models. Um, as background, I'll just give you a quick uh, background on, on our research lab and, and what we study. We, we study um, the intersection between systems thinking, which is really the study of systems and cognition, and embodied metacognition, which is just a big fancy word that means uh, how do we gain more awareness and how do we know that it can be taught and learned and those kinds of things and interacting with the human brain. Um, and as a result of those, that, that, those two sort of intersected studies, we have sort of three focus areas. Um, we do research into theory and practice, and then we're also very interested in sort of media lab style technology and tools development, so developing sort of rich and robust tools to use for systems thinkers. And one that has become incredibly important is just public understanding um, to try to, you know, like Gerald said, there, you can't learn systems thinking overnight, and so, and yet it's something that everybody really needs to sort of have a better, better, better handle on to handle the kind of complexity that we're dealing with in society. Um, but we need to simplify some of these complex theories uh, without any loss of fidelity to the, to the theory and that type of thing. And then I'll tell you, in, in, in my work in this field, I'm, um, I'm consistently asked one question, and it's a pretty simple question. It's, what is systems thinking? And so, as a doctoral student, I was really surprised at how complicated the answers were, and there was a lot of hand-waving and things like that, which I distrust. So, uh, so I began to, to look at, um, to take a look at all the different answers that I that that could possibly, you know, answer this question, and see if there could be some kind of pattern that underlie all those answers. Um, and so I was kind of a, at first shocked by what I found. Um, this is a list of sort of like many of the most popular types of answers that you might might come upon in the beginning, and each one of those, of course, is quite complex. But then it got even more complex. Um, I, I coined this term the MFS universe of systems thinking. It stands for Midgley, Francois, and Schwartz. And uh, Midgley being the, the guy that you just heard. So um, who's really kind of the comprehensive you know, historian of the field and practitioner and, and that type of thing. So you know, these four volumes have 97 papers in them, each on a, a very, very complex set of theory. Um, and then Schwartz's thousand node map, it's, it's just a node map, it doesn't have a whole lot of information behind it, but each one of those thousands of nodes is either a whole discipline or subfield or a big concept or a theory. And then, of course, the encyclopedic version of that is 3,800 entries, uh, each one of which you could spend you know, a pretty long time learning. So I'm thinking, wow, that, that is a lot of stuff to try to figure out. And um, it would take a lifetime to become an expert in just one or two or three of these things, never mind you know, trying to find a way to master all of them. Um, but it does give us a nice lit review. And for people like myself and, and Gerald and others who, who you know, enjoy this stuff, you know, these, are, these are great things to have fun with, and it's important to explore each and every one of them. And we can look at what are some of the specialized applications, and we can look at what's hot and trending as a, as a discipline and we can look at what's sort of remained static over time, or what theories and practices have gone mostly cold, or which ones have gone cold but were incredibly influential to other theories being spawned or other practices being spawned. Um, but all of this has to be in contrast to the, this jungle of theories, has to be kind of in contrast to something much more simple. So I went to careerbuilder.com and I typed in systems thinking, and you know, 73 jobs in the last 30 days have systems thinking as a requirement of the job. And these are jobs from CEOs to you know, uh, mid-level people to low-level people. They're all over the map. They're you know, every kind of job you could possibly imagine. And of course, that's just one site. And so the question is, in practice, what does it mean to be a systems thinker? I mean, does it mean that you have to master those 3,800 entries and the thousands of nodes and 97 different big sort of practices, 
Um, it clearly doesn't mean that when we talk about what is it that we want in society democratically for people to be able to be systems thinkers. So, of course, I, I was really kind of interested in this. And so a decade ago, somewhat tongue in cheek and definitely completely anecdotally, I put together this stages of understanding systems thinking, um, mostly for an American audience, because it does differ internationally. And it kind of caught on. And uh, it does sound like coffee being made, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, it sounds like we're inside the coffee machine. So I, I think it, you know, it caught on because I think it reflects um, some of the frustrations that newcomers have when they kind of try to come to systems thinking and they, get, they see this absolute jungle of, of things. And so I, I'll just take you through it real quick. I mean, the first stage I call the honeymoon stage. And most people come to systems thinking because their current models aren't working. They're dealing with something more complex than their models are allowing for. And so they're looking for something new, something, and, and they hear about it, and at this stage it offers hope. And it also tends to offer a lot of jargon. And they fall in love, um, and sometimes they sort of uh, drink the Kool-Aid and, and buy into all kinds of very quickly stated things like false prophets, I call them, like everything is connected, which it's not. And, uh, you know, this is not about reductionism, it's about holism, which is an absurdity. Uh, or any of the other sort of um, commonplace things you might hear. But at this point, they're either smitten with it and kind of drink the Kool-Aid and move on, discontinue any further study, or it gives them a language a little bit to talk about it and to try to dig deeper. So then they go to, um, a, a, when they're exposed to, typically in the United States, a very specialized type of systems thinking called system dynamics. And um, it's a technical approach that was developed by engineers at MIT in the 1950s and popularized by Peter Senge in the 1980s with the Fifth Discipline and lots of other books. And so it's very much out there and it's very much what people run into. And it really took a lot of engineering principles and applied them to sort of human organizations and things like that. And to be brief, many newcomers, um, systems dynamics is an incredibly powerful tool, like a hammer is, but to some extent, when you're exposed to it, sometimes you start to see every problem as a nail. And, and so um, in the next stage, if you go dig a little deeper, I call it the uncomfortable ignorance stage. And uh, it, it's brought on by wondering whether or not there's anything more than feedback loops and stocks and flows, which is what system dynamics kind of uh, heads into. And uh, you can sort of see the geometry of it getting thicker and stuff like that. So this search then leads them to this jungle of methodological pluralism, where they get to see all kinds of stuff. And of course, it's all very confusing. Um, and this is what I call the big tent phase, right? Because it's like, you know, if you've got a theory, come on in. You know, this is systems, and so we're very appreciative of all those kinds of things. So, and at this stage, I think a newcomer to systems thinking has a couple options. They can choose a tribe and belong to it, so then you get sort of locked into that particular theory or that particular model. Or you can lose all hope because it's just too messy. Or worse, you can become a paid systems theorist, uh, which is the, the worst of all possibilities. You know, right? So the, uh, and, and, and I'll tell you that this 10 years ago, and still to a large part today, this is sort of the contemporary state of the field. Um, and I, as a doctoral student, was really unhappy with this. It just bugged me that I couldn't like, really get, get at the, the, the root of it or the core. So I spent quite a bit of time. The reason it bugged me, the problem with it, is because this complicated sort of morass of big tent pluralism is, is, is describing examples of systems thinking. And th to answer that that's what systems thinking is, is a little bit like answering the biologist question, what is life? by listing a bunch of plants and animals, right? It's not really an answer. It's, it's a lot of examples, and you can kind of go, okay, I'm starting to get a hang of it, but it doesn't really, in my estimation, sort of say, what, what is life fundamentally? What's it all about? What does it require? That type of thing. And so um, it, it brings you to, uh, over the past decade, I've, I've sort of developed what I call systems thinking version 2.0, it, and, as being a, a name for this emerging sort of new kind of thinking, which is, yeah, there's all these incredible methods, but what is the pattern of, of connection that crosses all of them, right? And that's a systems thinking approach to systems thinking in a way. 
Um, and so I can all call this the get meta stage because you're kind of being meta level, you're sort of being a systems thinker about systems thinking. And what we've discovered is that there are very simple patterns that underlie systems thinking. And we call them, we give them names, the MCL and DSRP. But we've also discovered something pretty surprising that we didn't expect, and that is that while those patterns are really, really simple to understand, um, there's a mindset or a paradigmatic mindset that, stop, that we have from traditional types of thinking that makes it really difficult, even if you sort of understand those things, those models, it makes it really diff difficult to deeply understand them. And so we really have dealt with this mindset a lot. Um, if I had to summarize and boil down into a bullion cube what systems thinking is all about or what its purpose is, I think this statement captures it better than any other that I've found. And it, and it, is, it really fundamentally is about that most of the problems that we experience in every sector and in every discipline have a lot to do with our ways of thinking being out of alignment with the ways that systems and nature and, and the universe work. Um, so, one of those ways is called complex adaptive systems. And whether you like it or not, all systems thinking is a complex adaptive system. Now, that doesn't mean that every system that you will be interested in and study is a complex adaptive system. But systems thinking as a cognitive thing is a very adaptive and complex uh, system. Also, all humans and all organizations are complex adaptive systems. So if you're dealing with those kinds of things, then you really deeply have to understand this notion. Now, for t about 2,500 years of sort of intellectual pursuit, we have thought that underlying complexity, if we saw something that was complex and robust and adaptive, that that would probably mean that there were layers and layers and layers of complicated subsystems underneath. And um, so let me give you an example of what I mean by complicated versus complex. So if I kick a rock three times, right? Each time I kick the rock, it pretty much does what a rock does when you kick it, right? It follows sort of the laws of physics and it does the first, second, and third time the same thing. But if I kick a dog three times, and you shouldn't kick dogs, but if you, if you did it uh, in a thought experiment, you know, the first time maybe it would run away a little bit, and the second time it might growl, and the third time it bites. So it's adapting, right? And that's really kind of what defines a complex adaptive keyword system, is that it changes its behavior. It doesn't just do the same thing every time. It sort of changes. And so what we now know is that underlying these complex systems, which are like human organizations and anything sort of organic and wet and those kinds of things, um, are simple, actually simple rules, not, not, uh, not complicated subsystems, but simplicity. So let me give you a quick example. Take a look at these uh, flocking behavior of what amounts to millions of starlings. And look at how quickly millions of starlings go from going left to going right. It happens in an instant, right? It's pretty absolutely amazing, really. And this kind of baffled scientists for a long time because what we originally thought was there must be in these systems, they must really have incredible leader birds, right? It's something about really great leadership is causing this. But of course, it's happening so quickly, there's not even time for communication from a leader to a follower to occur. So that can't possibly be the case. And when we, but, but, but what we found is these, these systems, which we see from across the physical and biological and chemical and sociological and psychological sciences are based on simple local rules. So let me give you an example of what that looks like. Ian Cousins did a, um, simulation to show the rules for this particular system. And what these birds are doing is maintaining a distance of x locally to their neighbors. And then they're co-adjusting directionality locally to their nearest neighbors. And then the third rule is they avoid predators. So that's it. There's no leadership. There's, there's uh, no global awareness of what's going on. There's simply sort of local awareness and simple rules based on what your neighbors are doing, right? Does that make some sense? It's like a, that's like a hawk coming in to get a bird. And uh, what's amazing about this is you can actually see the rules. These are two hawks coming in to get the birds, and you can see the undulation of the rule go down the system, right? And these birds down here, they are following rule one and two, and they don't even know that those ones up there followed three. So they're just 
alternating rules based on, based on what's going on around them. Um, here's an example of the largest human wave, 80,000 people at a NASCAR event. And again, we call these things superorganisms. They're because you have a bunch of single organisms that are actually acting as if they're one organism, right? And this is a very simple rule, right? Just if they do whatever the person to your left does. If they stand up, stand up. If they sit down, sit down. Uh, no leadership required, but you get complex uh, behavior. So there's a relatively simple formula or, or understanding of what these complex systems do. And it basically is that you have these independent agents of various kinds. It could be people, it could be whole organizations, it could be ants, it could be anything. And they follow these simple rules locally. And out of the collective behavior of those simple rules, you get complex emergence or emergent complexity. That makes some sense, yeah? So I want to uh, talk today a little bit. Laura's going to share more about sort of simple rules of systems thinking, which, which I talk on a lot uh, for individuals. But I'd like to focus, because I know a lot of people are from SEPA and things like that, and you deal with a lot of organizational type things. Um, so I wanted to deal with organizational sort of styles of systems thinking today. So let's take a look first at the traditional mental model of organization. In general, our mental model is that we plan, right? We, we, uh, we, we get put together a plan. And then once we kind of come up, come up with a plan, sometimes they're way farther ahead than is really feasible, but we've, we've shortened that. Um, we, we like to command hierarchically. We love org charts, right? So we create a little org chart that says this is how people are organized. Of course, they're not, but that's, we like them. And then we like that sort of structure so much that we turn it on its side and then use it for process control, so command and control behavior. And then, um, of course, we need somebody to, to, to implement, so we sort of a lot of times take you know, human juice and that fuels whatever it is that we need to do. And for the most part, this is uh, relatively good because it makes us feel like we're in control. And when, when, when we get upset with the process is when we get the results oftentimes because we don't get the results that we want. And so the results are the things that cause us to start going looking for new mo mental models because, because it didn't work. So we need to transition, I think, from sort of a, 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 the traditional mental model of organizations to a more uh, complex and adaptive system of organization. And, um, what does that look like? So my particular research focuses on two different theories of systems thinking. One is sort of an individual level scale uh, systems thinking, what's happening with individuals. And then the other is what happens when you get those individuals into organizations together. And um, with the help of more at translational research, uh, you don't have to understand the sort of theory, theoretical structures behind it, but we just give them sort of nicknames like BMCL and BSRP. Um, and let me just show you what, what that looks like. So how do you get, for example, from individual systems thinking to organizational systems thinking? In a nutshell, what these theories describe are that there are four patterns of thinking or systemic thought, which Gerald kind of hit on a little bit. Um, distinctions, I call them distinctions, he calls them boundaries, same thing, basically. Um, relationships, perspectives, and uh, systems. And we use these patterns of, to structure thought uh, and to, to have systemic thought. And Laura's going to talk a little bit more about this later, so I'm not going to hit on it too much. But the constant adaptation of all these mental models uh, is called learning, right? If we have a mental model and we change the mental model, that's fundamentally what learning looks like. And um, learning is critical because it if we, when we, we can learn both as an individual, but as also as an organization if we share the learning or share the mental model building together. So you can have organizational learning or individual learning. And um, an organization of any kind, and, and this is kind of incredibly important, is a function of shared mental models, which is what we typically call culture. But that's a really important idea, that culture is really not a mystical thing. It's the sharing of mental models. And so we want to share those mental models and adapt them through learning. That what you can see is that DSRP kind of drives learning and learning drives culture. And then the, the two model, models that are most important 
to share in an organization, although there could be hundreds or thousands of mental models being shared, um, are the vision and the mission. And what a vision is, is uh, your kind of goal state of the organization. And what a mission is, is the simple rules, right? Like the birds have the simple rules. The mission is a simple rule set. So um, moving from uh, what, what, what DSRP and VMCL gets us is away from sort of a traditional model of organizational design. Um, but if we're not really aware of that traditional model, then it'll come back to haunt us no matter how many methods we learn. And we've seen that time and time again. So here's an example of somebody doing systems thinking. This is a real world example, so you can kind of ground it. Um, they spent millions on this particular example. The CIA and the Pentagon spent, it's a multi-million dollar map. It's a system dynamics map. It was developed to fight the war in Afghanistan. Okay, so it's a systems based map but it was done in a, in, a, in a paradigm that was very traditionally command and control. And this is what the uh, generals who were responsible for implementing this map said about it. So, in, you know, this one, very, very important. It's dangerous because it can create the illusion of understanding and the illusion of control. And the truth is that when humans look at big network maps like that, they're really cool and we think they're neat looking, but we actually don't get a whole, we don't glean a whole lot from them. Um, computers don't even sort of look at them, they look at the data. But when we look at those big visual splats, we don't actually glean a whole lot from them cognitively. They're very difficult for humans to sort of sort out. But they're pretty and they, they look cool. And it looks like we have sort of an understanding of them. Um, this, is a, this is a four star general, George Casey Jr. And he uh, is a systems thinker who coined the phrase uh, VUCA world, which is an acronym for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And so, you know, definitely sort of a systemic problem. And here's his simple mission that he came up with. Clear, hold, build. So these are literally life and death examples, right? People are basing their, their life and death decisions on these different versions of systems thinking. And they're both trying to systems think, but the paradigm underlying one is very different than the paradigm underlying the other. This is what uh, General Casey had to say about it. It's essential to distill a message into a few key points and hone its delivery. After trying and failing to communicate our strategy, we went back to the drawing board and came up with clear hold build and recommunicated it, and it was much better understood. So what is he really talking about? He's talking about simple rules, and he's talking about building shared mental models that are understood by everybody in the organization. It's a mission-based, simple rule structure. So with, with near perfection, a lot of visions and missions that we create for organizations, and visions and missions aren't what you think they are. They're goal states for the organization, and they're, they're simple rules that the everybody in the organization follows. But most of the time we create them, they come out, even if we spend a lot of money, they come out quite not so great. And part of this is because of a, a thing we created called the litmus test that gives us sort of rule structures on how to create them. And I'm not going to be able to go into each of these today, but um, uh, suffice to say that this litmus test we found working with hundreds of companies and hundreds of organizations, informal and formal, corporate, private, Nonprofit, NGOs, big, you know, all of it. Um, that if you follow these sort of uh, litmus tests on vision and mission, goal states, and simple rules, it works out pretty good. But let's take a look at a bad vision, which the immense irony is intended. This is the vision for the uh, Santa Fe Institute for the Study of Complex Adaptive Systems. So talk about mocking, right? There it is. And I might help you to see it in Greek. Right? I got about the same thing out of both versions. You know, there's no way you can build an organization around ideas that are so complex and have them shared across where you have such difficulty with language and things like that. So that's a, a terrible mission. Here's another one uh, I, I saw that I thought was kind of, kind of made me chuckle. So this is a bank that they wanted to be the trusted resource and then in their mission, they already are the trusted resource. So they're sort of done, right? And what this, is, what this is sort of showing is that we don't actually know the difference between vision and mission. 
Um, we confuse them all the time. The vision is the goal state of the, the shared understanding of the goal state of the organization in simple terms. And the mission is the simple rule structure that you do over and over again. So let's look at sort of not so sucky vision missions. Here's a fantastic one. Convert the unconverted. A classic mission statement, very simple instructions, simple mission based thing. And here's the vision that if you do the mission repeatedly, you get. And this is why you know, every religion in the world has basically used this mission and vision regardless of what, which, which type of world that you're after. And it, the one that's even better than this is a, a pretty simple one. And that one leads after repeat after repetition, actually and the emergent property of that is biodiversity. So these are very simple ones. This one is for, you know, not quite as profound, but this is our organizational one. Engage, educate, and empower seven billion thinkers worldwide. And this has been adopted by schools and districts and organizations across the country because of its simplicity and because we can get it into a shared mental model of culture. Does that make some sense? It has to be shared. Visions aren't things that are on walls, they're things that are in heads. Um, so, a lot of what we do when we think about systems in the old mindset is we try to control and command and manage and lead the stuff above the red line. And that stuff is emergent. It comes out of the collective dynamics of what's happening below the red line. And so we really should be focusing more on what's happening below the red line and then evolving it so that when, to see whether or not we get what we're interested in. But the, the complex dynamics and the complex emergence is not something that we're going to be able to command and control. Um, so th that's just kind of a wrap up of, of sort of VMCL and DSRP being at, uh, at, at the root of, a, I think, an emerging modern synthesis that kind of helps us to have language that even though you might be focused on system dynamics, and even though you might be focused, you're going to hear about really cool things that, that are being done in transportation systems or things that are being done in school systems, which could you know, be very, very different, and they might be using very, very different methods, but there is this sort of emerging synthesis where all of those different people that are after similar things but in different scenarios are able to communicate across those different applications. So I, I appreciate uh, that's it for me, and next we'll be hearing from Dr. Gao about transportation systems. <laughs>